Hello, everybody, and good morning. My name is Tomas Tungus. I'm your host for Office Hours, and this is a program where we invite luminaries from startup land to share their insights. It's a unique format where we gather questions from the audience ahead of time, weave them into a conversation, and have founders and executives also ask questions along the way. Uh, these have been a huge success. Our recent guests include Leif Kirkpatrick, the former CFO at Twilio, and Claire Hughes-Johnson, former uh, CEO at Stripe. Thanks to everybody who registered today. We had more than 900 people registered, gathered the questions, and um, have coalesced them for, the, for this incredible conversation we're about to have with Lars. We'll take about 60 minutes to go through it. Uh, the first 30 to 35 minutes will be a fireside chat where we'll go back and forth and then leave questions open at the end. Please do use the uh, questions feature um, or the chat. I'll be monitoring those throughout, and uh, we'll look forward to fantastic conversations. Um, so I'm hugely privileged to introduce Lars. He's, I think, the most experienced and probably most successful sales development leader um, that I know of and probably in all of startup land. He's completed tours of duty at five companies that have gone public, Snowflake, Cloudera, ArcSight, Portal, and one more I missed in the list. Which one is that one? Riverbed. Riverbed, that's the one that I missed. Um, and then he also started a, a sales source, which was a sales consultancy advised many, many startups to great success. So ha has seen everything from the very early days to absolutely massive decacorns. Um, today, what we're going to do is we're going to cover two main topics that emerged from the audience questions. Uh, that's how to run a sales team well in general. And the second that's more timely is how to change the, the operations of a team during a downturn or a recession, which we may be facing. So without further ado, let's jump in. Lars, thank you so much for being here. We've been friends for, for a long time. I'm so grateful you, you agreed to, to join us on the show today. Thank yeah, you. this is, uh, I've been excited for this for a couple of weeks. Uh, I can't wait to get started. <laughs> awesome. Cool. So the first question is, and this was a very common question is, what does it mean for a sales team to work well? How do you know as a manager, maybe at like the early stage, that things are humming? What does that look like? Um, so, uh, obviously team culture, um, has a lot to do with it. One of the things that I tell the younger in their career sellers, um, through their onboarding, uh, when they come to Snowflake is listen, you're in week two of your one month onboarding. Um, I'm going to develop you. I'm going to train you. I'm going to enable you. Um, I'm going to give you playbooks. Um, and when you exit that onboarding enablement and training, you are going to have all of the tools that you need to do your job well. But I'm going to give you two other things. I'm going to give you a frontline sales manager, SDR manager, that's going to continue that development and inspire, coach, and mentor you. And then I'm going to give you a third thing. I'm going to give you a team that you're going to go on to that's also going to take care, buddy up with you and make sure that you um, uh, get off the ground and spread your wings. Um, and with those three things, training enablement, mentorship, uh, inspiration from, from people, um, I believe I'm giving you everything you need. And there's only one thing I ask in return is that when you join your team, knowing that you have everything you need to do your job, start doing it and don't become a drag on uh, the rest of the world, right? That fire in the belly, that self-starter, self-motivated mentality that we hired, um, go and, and take flight. So, I mean, the answer to your question is you have to provide an onboarding enablement and training experience so they know what they're doing. And then if you give them a cultured team, that will embrace them and a manager that cares for them, then I think that you have a recipe for uh, people that will produce for you, that will uh, engage with your, you know, uh, prospects and, uh, you know, uh, create pipeline for your company. That makes sense. So you've got three things. You've got the training, in other words, the core of what you're going to be doing. You have a manager who has your best interests at, at heart, and then you have a peer, someone you can go to for like more tactical advice that you wouldn't necessarily want to go to your manager all the time for. And so that's how you know that you've got the right organizational structure to support a sales team. Is that right? I, I, I believe absolutely. And especially with people earlier in their careers, uh, people coming into in high velocity inside sales teams or sales development teams, right? Different 
if you're a 10 year, 15, 20 year veteran of quota carrying enterprise sales. But I think in the beginning, whether you're hiring someone that's changing careers, um, we're hiring a lot of teachers right now, um, people returning to the workforce, maybe returning military veterans, certainly people coming out of high school and junior college and universities earlier in their career or changing, they do need development. They need training and they need playbooks. And right, if you show them what really good looks like and you hire for this kind of fire in the belly, self-motivating mentality, um, I think you can take someone, put them on the front lines of a demand gen, outbound demand gen operation, and they can begin uh, you know, getting meetings, producing pipeline for you and your company. And I think the, the main ingredient is, do they feel comfortable, not just in the company, but on the team? And again, a lot's been said about return to work post COVID and right, all of a sudden, two and a half, three years ago, overnight, every single seller in the world became an inside seller. Yeah. And now it's two and a half, three years later. And I can tell you that at Snowflake, we are slowly going back to the office right now, one, maybe two days a week, and the camaraderie and the energy that is happening on these teams, um, they're loving it. Um, and to get that interaction day to day to, you know, take the rookie cord and listen to one of your peers, uh, you know, rip maybe 15 to 50 cold calls and see what happens is exciting. Um, and that's how we're generating and creating energy on the teams. Fascinating. Okay, I, I definitely want to talk about that um, and that transition back. That's fascinating. Um, but going going back, so you got these three points around surrounding somebody who's got fire in the belly. You, you surrounded them with the right people, the right document, the right uh, training materials, and and now you're a quarter or two in. What are you looking for to to know that this person is working out? Are you looking for input metrics, like the number of calls? Are you looking for output metrics, like the number of leads? Like how, how do you determine whether somebody's a good long-term fit? Yeah, so for me, I, I'm not a micromanager. Uh, I am not going to manage my teams by the number of dials or the number of opens or the number of replies or, uh, you know, whether it's cold calls or connects. Uh, I don't like that. I think if you hire the right person, and you give them the right training and the right environment, then they should be able to take off on their own. So I'm looking for someone, right, who has that fire in the belly to just start doing their job. And again, you know, we're, we don't have many uh, metrics on our comp plan. We have one and one only, and that is, did you execute, did you create a meeting in a target account with a target persona for one of your AEs? Um, and we have a quota around that, right? The only thing that an SDR, in my opinion, can control is did they get the meeting booked yeah. with yeah. the right person at the right company? You know, better if it's at the right time. But again, uh, you're not really ever going to know that until you begin that engagement. So again, there's a lot of people that will add other components to an SDR comp plan. Um, I'm pretty vocal uh, about only using the one because it's the one that the SDR can control. Once we, once an SDR hands off that meeting to an account exec, yeah. whether or not they decide to move it up, move it back, or just let it sit there is the decision they make. And I want to pay my SDRs for what they can control, which is the meeting. Okay. That's great. Okay. Scott, uh, Lark, Scott asked a question and we talk a lot about, uh, venture capital. I, I talk a lot about SDR to AE ratios, and sometimes you see that being half an SDR per AE. Sometimes you see that being one to one. You've clearly, seen quite a lot. Do you have an? Is there an ideal? Like as you think about staffing your teams compared to your to match? Yeah, I do. Teams? And uh, for those of you that know these names or you do not, go check out Trish Bertuzzi of the Bridge Group and Craig Rosenberg currently of Gartner, they're the two personas that dating back two decades have been getting out um, these kinds of best practices. And I would say that for B2B SaaS, um, it is standard to have one SDR for every three account executives. Okay. 
And again, what I'm talking about now is enterprise class B2B. I'm not talking about, you know, you're selling a, a one to five, maybe $10,000 nice to have uh, widget. I'm talking about, you know, more complex solution oriented enterprise class sales. Uh, when you have that, um, an average sales cycle of, you know, three plus months, and you're selling something $25,000 or more that has an opportunity to grow, upsell, and renew, then I believe in my heart of hearts that the SDR motion is a must because the motion of prospecting and the motion of selling are, they couldn't be more different. And to ask a seller to prospect and then also negotiate, you know, sell and close is just, it's just too hard. Uh, again, if you consider that the hardest part of closing any deal is finding it, which is the art of prospecting, give that part to the SDR, right? Believe that they can do that for you. And then you as a seller go off and take those meetings and build your pipeline. So again, one to three is, I think, uh, a standard classic metric. Now, if you're a young company and you haven't uh, built out a, a, a sales team yet, uh, you know, and you're not at scale, I would advocate for adding more SDRs, one to two, one to one. And in fact, we have this unbelievable story of this company called Procore that you may have heard of, right? Their CRO, Dennis Leandris, came into that company seven years ago and ended up inverting the uh, density coverage ratio and had two SDRs for every account executive. And he completely changed the dynamic of their pipeline. He grew the pipeline, you know, it wasn't just two to three X, it was four, five, six X. And all of a sudden we began to see Procore grow, you know, after eight years of, you know, 10 to 25 million in revenue, they all of a sudden went to 50 and then a hundred and then 300 and then they went public. Now today, Procore has dialed that back. They're back to one to one, one to two. But again, the, the you know, what is the answer? I would say, you know, start at one to three and then decide, you know, based on your segmentation, um, whether or not it deserves more or less. But the most efficient pipeline generation uh, role that exists in any company, in my opinion, is the SDR. Right. If you're going to get rid of anyone for whatever reason, don't get rid of the pipeline generation. Right. That's the air that every company, every startup breathes. It's what creates predictability. And you'll never get more pipeline than when you have an onboarded, excited, fire in the belly SDR. Totally. That's fascinating. I've never heard that, but it makes a lot of sense. Staff up on SDRs before you staff up on AEs in order to build the pipe. Well, I mean, AEs, they want meetings, uh, right? right? Uh, if you're going to dedicate an AE's time to prospecting, right? Every minute they're prospecting, they're not necessarily selling, negotiating, and closing. Yeah. And an SDR, guess what? Today, the, the tools uh, and the processes that we follow, they're, 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 they're pretty. I mean, an SDR at Snowflake is managing anywhere from five to 13 different systems in any given day, Wow! right? Whether it's uh, Zoom Info or Lucia for uh, data and numbers, uh, outreach for our sequencing combined with Sendoso for our, you know, our, our sends, uh, doing research online on LinkedIn, um, you know, trying to understand how to personalize, right? There's a level of detail that SDRs have every day when they come in to their command and control center that AEs just don't have. And uh, so, um, you know, AEs want to prospect less. They can't stand it. It's the hardest part of any sales job. <laughs> they'll, they'll tell you, and they'll tell you that. Right. And if you have an SDR that has been trained, enabled, and optimized for the modern account-based outbound demand gen, then you have a recipe to build your company and go through all the stages of financing. Again, T Tomas, I've seen this rinsed and repeated again and again and again. I believe it. You, you got the experience. I, I mean, I take your word as, as a fact. So uh, just so on that topic, right, you've got, and I love the way that you framed it, which is that the SDR is the most powerful lead generation 
um, person inside of a company. You you have two people on each on either side of an SDR. You've got the marketing team, and then you have the AEs, right? How how do you see the the role of the SDR? How do you interface with those teams effectively? Yeah, so we sit right in the middle. And again, um, I will tell you that I report into demand generation marketing at Snowflake, who then reports into our CMO. Um, I've been in sales my entire career, but at Snowflake, we made a very intentional decision to put SDRs inside of marketing and behind our very professional and our very kind of globally renowned account-based marketing motion. And so we point our account-based marketing motions at our targeted personas and our target accounts. And then we very intentionally draft our SDRs after that warm-up motion, which usually takes three to four weeks. And then we uh, cover that off at the end with a very intentional, deliberate account-based sales development motion. And so we have our sequences lined up, our touch patterns lined up for when um, Denise and Hillary decide we're going to, uh, you know, target these 25 accounts in this segment in this region. Um, Then we go, the AEs that have put their accounts into this motion, they know to not, not do outreach. Customer success services, training, do not call these accounts at all because we are doing a warm-up motion with our outbound account-based marketing. And so you're coordinated across all the, the go-to-market functions so you can maximize the efficiency. You're not wasting time, dollars, effort on any of the ones that aren't ready. Any that's, a, that's exactly right. And, and, and the beauty of an SDR following an account-based marketing motion um, is that you have people now that have, whether it's the, the logo or it's a piece of content that they may have clicked on, they have Snowflake on the mind. And they might have tripped over one of the assets that we sent them very intentionally. Um, And it's very sophisticated. They're going to microsites, right, when they click on things that are purpose-built for their type of persona, their vertical. Um, And so... So Just interrupt. So there's like an email campaign focused on a particular persona vertical that drives you to a microsite. You might download, engage some content. There's some metrics there. And then all of that is then fed to an SDR team three to four weeks later, who is then has, has their own playbook in order to engage. Them. Yes. And, and, and yes, uh, at a very high level, that is what happens. And again, it's not in, in advance of the email campaign is the branding campaign is the, okay. is the campaign of uh, whether it's banner ads or it's content, right? We're serving up uh, digital content and assets that are meant to educate and inspire these people at companies that may not know who we are uh, and what we do, but because we're targeting the people that we believe have the pain uh, for the problem that we can solve for them, because we've done a lot of deals in a lot of companies across a lot of segments and a lot of geographies and a lot of verticals, we know the titles of the people at the companies that we want to reach out to. So as we go from the U S to Europe and to APJ, we have a recipe and we have the types of lookalike personas and lookalike companies that we know we can affect um, and bring our solutions into and serve up, right? The right digital content that will get people to go, huh, wow. And whether it's creating fear of missing out or it's just inspiring and educating them to doing something brand new with our technology, uh, our job is to get them curious and then, the SDR comes in <laughs> at the end of that motion with even more personalized, contextualized uh, content right. in the form of emails and voice messages that we leave. Yeah. And then would you talk about that transition from the, the transition from the SDR to the AE? How, how do you do that? Well, so that is a widely talked about. Um, uh, it's, it, it's affectionately known to some as the dead zone because that's where a lot of kind of teed up meetings will go to either die or get fumbled. And it's very, for any of you on listening to this uh, and you're wondering what happens in the handoff from a sales development rep to an account executive, man, take a microscope out and go through that process and understand what automation is in place. 
Um, because again, um, you may have an account executive that is full up. They have, they have too many deals that are working and they've got motions and they may not Right. They're like, you know what? Oh, my God. Another one. Really? I'm going to put that one over here for, you know, uh, a rainy day. Uh, or you may have someone that just has nothing and they will consume and eat all of these uh, and want more. But the key is to make sure that the because, again, when an SDR tees up a meeting, they've got someone that has said yes to a 25 minute meeting. One, two, three, four or five days later, that meeting has to execute. And that meeting has to happen. And then after it happens, we rely on the account executive to make a decision. Did I make a connection? Am I going to continue to uh, uh, want to you know, set up a second meeting? If that's the case, then yes, we want to put that meeting and that potential opportunity into some uh, form of pipeline, early stage in your instance of CRM. Um, and we rely on the account executive to accept that, to update the stage, the close date, and the amount, and put in notes and the people that were in that meeting, and then some notes on what they believe is going to happen next, right? Uh, hopefully, they got someone interested, and now they want to, you know, next meeting is with their sales engineer, and they want to begin to, um, you know, drive deeper. Yeah. But to your point, a lot of meetings end up in the dead zone and you should inspect that handoff process and make sure it's closed loop. And that if it doesn't go into the pipeline, that there's some a feedback mechanism to tell the SDR why they did or didn't so they can get better. And that, in my opinion, is probably one of the most important aspects of a handoff. Tell the SDR what you liked and maybe what you didn't like as much about that meeting, uh, that motion, help the SDR get better at their job for you, the AE. That makes sense. So we, we've talked about that, you know, the, the role with marketing, live in marketing. We've talked about the, the, the handoff between sales, between sales development and sales. One of the questions that, I mean, you've, you've got this, and you talked a lot about ABM, right? Which is this account-based marketing, identifying the people that you want to go after, doing a solution sale, softening the, the ground with air cover, with marketing first, then, sale, then sales development, and then sales. You were very early on to ABM. I can't remember which company it was, but you kind of pioneered it. And now we've got, like, if you think about, uh, and Snowflake, right, is known for, for, in the early days, was really known for, like, credit card swipe to massive net dollar retention. Right? I think the last public number was, like, 171% net dollar retention. Right. And so if you're, if you're a software founder today, you've got three options, right? You can do PLG, like basically bottoms up. Let me just go through a credit card. You've got the mid market, and then you've got this ABM motion. How do you decide when to use which? Is so there, is there any, I think, think in the beginning, um, uh, as a founder, just getting off the ground, um, you need to understand uh, where your technology is solving problems, for whom, right? The, the personas, uh, the departments, the divisions, right? Because your technology at the end of the day um, is going to be implemented, installed, and used by people uh, to solve pain that they have. Um, I think as a young founder, you want to have as many stories of where your technology is solving problems. And then uh, what I would do as a founder is I would get a really good writer, uh, whether that's a product marketer or a digital content marketer who is either a good writer, producer, or they have access to people that can produce these stories, whether they're, it's a customer testimonial or it's a use case case study, or it, it's a uh, you know, a founder going onto a podcast talking about what they just did for this new customer, right? These stories have to come out. A seller, a marketer, an SDR without a story to tell is just flapping their gums, right? Um, right? You have to prove that you have solved a problem. And when you do, you want to, you know, yell out uh, at the top of your lungs, at the top of the mountain, how you did it and why it's so important. And at the beginning, I think it's also uh, be careful, like if you're a Bay Area startup and you get a 
you get some interest around you, but then all of a sudden someone from Tokyo comes in um, and they want to spend money. You know, be careful how and be deliberate about how you decide to grow your demand gen operation and your selling operation. Um, and I, I advocate for, you know, enterprise class SaaS companies, you know, decide on a target addressable market that is uh, that is uh, small enough. In other words, don't think that you can sell your product to, you know, a million people, a million entities. Start with a thousand or five thousand, um, and then understand the personas. Right? If if you're solving a problem for director level or manager level or ops or IT, um, I don't know that I would go right to the CEO, right? Uh, you need to try your messaging kind of all over the place and then begin to learn what is working. And I think for young startups, picking one or two verticals, one or two geographies, one or two personas, uh, because to ask a marketer to come up with content across many verticals, across many, it's just, it's hard. Um, and so get good uh, at where your technology is solving a problem and then grow from there uh, is, is one of the things. Now, again, we're 10 years into this at Snowflake. We are at scale, uh, thousands of customers, um, billions of dollars. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going into parts of Asia Pacific that, um, uh, you know, a lot of companies have never done before. We're trying um, uh, and trialing lots of different motions in Asia Pacific, which is a very different place to, to do outbound business. And we're learning a lot. That's fascinating. The, the storytelling part is, is super important. And, and you said something before where the, the marketing campaigns are either focused on FOMO, fear of missing out, or inspiration. Can you talk a little bit more about is that is that your framework for telling the right story in sales development? Well, again, I come from like enterprise infrastructure mm -hmm. kind of solution, big, big stuff. And I think as a seller, you really do have to um, understand what your return on investment is. At, right at the end of a sales dance, right at the end of a selling motion, the hopeful. Well, the first thing is the best thing you can do is get out of a bad deal early, right? Um, the number of times I've done a loss review uh, after a sales rep took a deal to nine months and then lost due to no decision, like that's no doubt a deal they should have gotten out of in, in week one or month one, but they hoped and prayed their way along. And then after nine months of selling and using resources, they get a loss. Um, second best outcome is close a large deal as quickly as possible. Yeah. And, uh, you know, with that uh, as a backdrop in trying to get it, you know, get to no quickly or get to yes, and then continue to get to yes um, and craft your deal. But there's got to be a return on investment because at the end of the dance, I'm going to ask you for a pile of money and you're going to receive my code or my service or my product that person you're selling to is going to end up having to go through procurement and having to get approvals uh, for this million dollar piece of software, let's say. If you, as the person buying this, are not able to show at least a 10x ROI, $10 million that we will end up getting, whether that's the result of automation or uh, averting losses or making more money, whatever the whatever the, the value component is, you have to be able to craft that in your sales campaign and be able for it to be defensible. So again, 10X, million dollars, I'm asking for a million dollars, but I'm, we, I've proven to you in the sales campaign that you're gonna get 10 million within three years. Like that is defensible. And that is something a buyer who uh, buys into can proudly bring to their procurement, bring to their, uh, C-level executive uh, to may help them make the yes decision. Yeah. You have to equip your champion effectively. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to make the sell internally on your behalf. Yeah, what did I say? No champion, no sale. Um, yeah. uh, 
on this quick qualification out, any tips there on, on how founders should think about if, if, how do you do that? Like, do you define an ICP narrowly? Do you look at product usage metrics? What, what are you typically looking for in order to say, you know what, this, we're out, this conversation isn't going to go anywhere? Is it well, brand? again, yeah, what I see a lot of, and again, you have founder led sales, and I think it's absolutely crucial for founders to run their own sales campaigns and their own sales motion for at least a year. Uh, I don't know if it was you or maybe it's Jason over at Saster that says uh, founders should be able to get their company to a million dollars in ARR. Um, and then, right, to go through the school of hard knocks to learn what deals going up, down and sideways means uh, to feel, you know, taste blood when they when they close a deal and to have the pain of a loss after a long sales cycle. All those things, I think, are really important before they hand over the reins to a head of, let's say. Um, but I think, um, getting to know early and again, um, what everyone has to, what all founders should realize is when they start a selling campaign, they have to realize that at some point they're going to have to ask for the order. Um, and you know, you need to back into, uh, so if after three months of selling you as the founder believe, you know, I, I think we're here in the sales cycle and I think the close date is two months out. They have to have the courage to ask their, right, their, their champion, hey, I'm putting a close date of August 29 on this deal. Um, and then just ask them, have the courage to ask, d d does that fit with your timeline? And then have the courage just to be quiet. And in that silence, everything will come out because if they're like, then you know you probably don't have a deal that's going to close in your time frame. And you may find out that you're talking to the wrong person based on what comes out of their mouth. Um, you know, if it's, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I need the proposal that has the ROI calculation so that I can bring it to procurement, which I have set up for, you know, two weeks from now. Now that very rarely happens, but again, you know, a really good enterprise class seller they understand how to back into deals and to create close plans and how to insert compelling events along the sales cycle to get to no or to get to yes or to get to the truth. You know what? I've never heard that before. Just asking the buyer, like, hey, if I put this date on this deal in pipe, is it reasonable? It, um, it's yeah. it's the probably the easiest, but the hardest, because guess what? No seller wants to hear no. <laughs> but the best sellers do. They want to get to know so they can, you know, okay, great. Well, you know, eventually I believe you will be. If you're not ready today, that is fine. But do you mind if I leave you on my slow drip content? Because it sounds like these areas were interesting to you. I can drip out some uh, thought leadership pieces to you on a monthly or quarterly basis and then right, engage and, and, and gain acceptance for how you're going to keep them in your funnel. Yeah. That's what the very best SDRs and sellers do is, right? And I, my opinion, when an SDR creates a meeting for an account executive and that meeting executes, the AE may find out that, wow, Snowflake, unbelievable. But you know what? We just made a decision for AWS, let's say. And we find out that we were just too late to the party. But what a fantastic piece of information that is for our seller to know that we just missed. You know what? That AE might say, hey, SDR, great job. You, you know, you were on the call. I'm not going to put this into my pipeline. But you know what? I want you to call uh, Amy in five months and ask her how it's going and see if there is a chance for us, right? You pay an SDR on that meeting, even though it didn't go into the pipeline all day long, because you just got a tremendous amount of value in understanding where that company was. Um, and the fact that they made a decision for cloud data storage is, is wonderful. So if you're a founder and you have that conversation and they have bought one of your competitors, feel good in knowing that people are buying technology that uh, you are selling, um, you know. Uh, I would much rather lose to competition than no decision. 
<laughs> no decision is probably one of the most empty feelings as a sales rep. Uh, it kind of tells them that, you know, I, you know, I don't want to be provocative, but, uh, you know, if you take a deal nine months and lose <laughs> no decision, the odds are you could have gotten out of that one uh, eight months earlier. Tomas, I lost you uh, on the video. Uh, can you still hear me and see me? I can still, yeah. All right. Yeah. I just lost my camera. Let's do it this way. Okay, fantastic. Well, I'm getting. I'm working on getting the camera going, but in the meantime, yeah. can you hear me, Lars? You can hear me? Okay, good. Let me yeah, I can hear you just fine. Okay, I want to go back to something that you said before, which was you're bringing sellers. You know, we're talking. There's there's this big change in the macroeconomic environment, and you're starting to you, after COVID's done. You're starting to bring people back to the office. Would you sh would you share with us a little bit about what motivated that? Why you're doing it? What you're seeing? Yeah, so we were we've been very careful, as have a lot of companies. Um, we've been uh, again. Uh, it's always been voluntary, um, but I can tell you that in the Sydney office of Snowflake, our SDRs go in four, if not five days a week because they want to be together. Um, there's this camaraderie, there's this teamsmanship where I don't think it's fear of missing out in that they're not, but they just, they love each other. They, they support each other. And so they want to be in the office in that environment. We have a very exciting location in our Sydney office. Maybe that's part of it. In our Amsterdam office, we provide lunch um, and we provide, you know, all the things that start, you know, startups and uh, hip, I guess, public companies do. And um, our SDRs in Amsterdam come in four, if not five days a week to eat together, to share stories. Um, and they're proud to be on the phone in the open area um, and rip dials together. Um, I would say in the United States, um, it's a little tempered. Uh, we have uh, Wednesdays in our San Mateo office, in our Denver office, uh, we're two days a week where uh, most people post up, um, but it's all voluntary. But the energy that comes from being together as SDRs that a lot of which are starting their careers and they want to be together, um, you know, after a long day of no's or phone slamming down, it's sometimes nice to go, whether it's the local watering hole or just hanging out in the open area and sharing stories. Um, um, I also know that my counterparts in engineering and services, I often get uh, uh, reached out to by the other functions in the office. They love the energy of the SDR team. There's a buzz. And um, we also, uh, Tomas, we happen to have a lot of real estate uh, at Snowflake. Yeah. So go, before the pandemic, we had really, you know, world-class facilities. And uh, we don't plan to give those up. Um, and I think as the wor world slowly comes back, I know that SDRs, uh, whether it's one, two, three, four, or five days a week, they're going to pick the days they want, um, and they get they get to choose. There's no overbearing; you have to at all here. Do, Lars, do you see any difference in performance in and out of the office, or any sort of differences in managing the team that are important? You know, I don't. Uh, I think the biggest. Uh, well, I joined Snowflake in the middle of the pandemic, so I wasn't oh, okay. there when things cut over, but. The stories I heard um, uh, from the field were that the performance did not suffer at all. And I think what happened, it just took uh, some getting used to. Um, and, uh, you know, we did have quite a few SDRs in certain places that uh, they were living, you know, in Denver, whether they were living with their parents or they were living with uh, a lot of, you know, roommates to go back and not have an office to go to sometimes cramped them a bit um, and they had to get used to it. But I think over time, over the years, a lot of people got very comfortable um, with the extra time they had not commuting, um, extra time they had not having to go to whatever meetings and they made more of their time on the phones. Um, 
And there's no doubt that, you know, Snowflake in the two years that I've been here, right, we've, there's been green lights for us for the most part. And we have a brand and we're surging um, and uh, we pay well and we have world-class onboarding enablement and training for this role. In, in fact, world-renowned, I would say. And so we're a draw for a lot of people that want to start their career in technology sales. Absolutely. It sounds that way. I mean, the, just the way that you talk about building a team, managing a team, training them, uh, it's, it's really, it's really quite something. Well, so Tomas, I got my, my first, so I graduated from UC Santa Barbara in 1988. And You're a banana first, slug? I didn't know that. That's amazing. Uh, that's UC Santa Cruz. I'm a gaucho oh, okay. from Santa Barbara. <laughs> Sorry. But no, it's okay. Uh, great school too. Uh, I got my first job with Xerox Corporation. And for those of you that are 10 years on either side of me, Xerox in the 80s, in the 70s and 80s, was globally renowned for onboarding enablement and sales training and also management training. And I'll never forget the 11 month onboarding experience I had getting trained externally and internally by the world's best. And what I have a chance to do today and, you know, Denise Pearson, our CMO, as uh, we've combined and we are creating uh, what everyone will soon find out is known as the Snowflake Sales Development Academy. And I'm going to have the opportunity to brand a globally recognized onboarding enablement and training experience for anyone that wants to change their career or start their career and get professionally developed for not just the first month of onboarding, but then the next 12 to 15 months while they're in the role of an SDR and learn how to become a quota carrying account executive. Because the talent pipeline that comes from the sales development organization in any company is the most efficient and effective. And you talk to any sales leaders in you know, B2B, RevTech, SaaS that have a SDR team, and you ask them about that talent pipeline that goes into the you know, sales organization as quota carriers. I mean, uh, right, we are, I'm literally, we are building Snowflake from the ground up with SDRs that are going through this program. 70 to 80% are going into quota carrying sales, but we also have younger in their career people that realize after 15, 18 months of SDR work that quota carrying is not what they want. And we've now, uh, we've now graduated SDRs into product marketing, into sales engineering, into our business development partnership group, um, uh, all into operations, into enablement positions. And so if you do this right, right, you build an SDR team that becomes, you know, your demand generation, right, your pipeline uh, building engine. And then over time, it becomes your talent engine. And you get this, these two critically important engines that are working for your company, you can leapfrog. I mean, this is what Salesforce.com did, right? If for those of you that haven't read Predictable Revenue by Aaron Ross, right? He wrote the book in 2004 about how sales development reps taking on the role of prospecting and letting sellers sell and SDRs prospect, you literally can leapfrog. And one enabled SDR can fill the pipeline of up to three AEs, right? Do you want your AEs that are probably one of the most expensive resources in your company to be sitting prospecting, or do you want them selling, negotiating, and closing? And that's the power of the SDR role, in my opinion. It's such a launch pad into the rest of the organization because you're getting all this training, you're understanding the end-to-end, -end, you know, you've got the end-to-end -end life cycle, the sales process, and you're interfacing with lots of different teams. And, you know, one of the questions in the audience that, that, that an audience member asked was, is this sort of a natural part? Like, how long do you expect an SDR to stay within the organization? What does that mean for your recruiting funnels? Yeah. Uh, again, very talked about um, subject in SDR land. At Snowflake, it's 15 to 18 months. Okay. And the difference is based on your performance. We have three bars that you have to hit in order to be considered uh, to be put into a pool where you can interview for the next role, whatever that may be. That's a tenure bar, it's a performance bar, and it's a culture bar. In other words, 
uh, does your manager uh, endorse you? Have you had that team spirited culture, uh, fire in the belly attitude? Um, um, have you been on the team for 15 months? Have you been performant two out of your last three quarters? If all those things uh, uh, coincide and synchronize, then yes, you get to put your name in the hat for um, whether that's our corporate account executive program that Mark Lindley runs globally, or it's another position uh, within the growing snowflake world. Um, that's kind of the, where, where we set the bar. Um, a lot of companies, and, and super important for those of you on this call that have SDR teams, if the jump from SDR to quota carrying AE in your company is too far, uh, a lot of times in my past, this happened at Cloudera, it happened at ArcSight, um, you know, an SDR that learns how to qualify over a year, year and a half, does not necessarily know how to enter, negotiate enterprise class deals. And if that's all you have for them to go to, then the best move for an SDR is outside your company because they can't make that jump. It takes years to develop negotiating talent for enterprise class deals. So one of the things I've done is I've created roles and positions for the SDR inside of ArcSight, inside of Cloudera, right? Whether it was renewals rep or, uh, you know, started talking to product about coming up with a lighter version, uh, right? Let's Maybe it's time for us to start a PLG motion with um, a product that can't be downloaded. And let's put some high velocity inside sales reps on that. But anyway, there's a little bit of a nuance there to make sure that you have a career path for your SDRs. Because if they hit that 15 to 18 month mark and there's nothing for them to do and the sales leaders realize, well, I can't take someone who has a year and a half in you know, pounding dials and uh, handling objections on the phone to quota carrying $3 million enterprise class solution sales selling, then uh, you're going to lose them. And you need to think about that part. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's really cool. Awesome. Okay, so one last question from the, the survey was, any favorite new software tools? I know you're not a micromanager. But uh, is there anything that's really caught your eye that sort of changed the game for you as, as a leader? That one of the world, you know, well, I'll just different. start by saying in SDR land, what changed the game historically, and this is, I guess it's about 10 years ago, was when ToutApp and Yesware came onto the scene with this technology platform called Sales Engagement. Mm -hmm. And... Um, today, we all know that Outreach and Sales Loft, and there's some others, Mixmax and Groove, and certainly there's a lot of other companies that are coming out with uh, sequencing engagement type. But this purpose-built platform gave to SDRs what, um, what, uh, what CRM did for sales and what marketing automation did for marketers. Uh, it put a lot of power in the hands of an SDR. Uh, to go one-to-one -one or one-to-many in a very personalized environment. And so with that as the backdrop, that, that one technology platform alone, sales engagement, has spurred the need for all these other really cool technologies. Um, we've all, you know, many of us probably all use LinkedIn Sales Navigator or Zoom Info. Now we're using Lucia or Lusha out in... Uh, uh, the European and APJ theaters for a data provider of personas, right? Emails and phone numbers. But we also use some of the cooler ones. We use Chili Piper. It really helps in the scheduling. Uh, so when there's so much in the world that we automate today, right? Inbound lead to account conversion uh, through lean data. If an inbound lead matches to a target account in our CRM, then have that go directly to the AE and SDR pairing. If it's not a target account, then have maybe your instance of Conversica or Drift or Outreach send out an automated response. There's a lot that can be done in uh, intentionally and very elegantly uh, pathing inbound. And also setting up an outbound cadence automatically that goes one to many in a specified account. So 
I would say the big story in SDR and even sales and marketing in general, Tomas, is the science of sales and marketing. Um, and as a young founder building out your first revenue operation, be careful not to hire sellers, marketers, SDRs without at some point early on getting that sales ops, rev ops, business ops person that understands how to select the technology and how to orchestrate it and how to implement it so that there's a motion, an inbound, automated inbound, automated outbound, semi-automated. Um, you know, at one point, you know, as we mature with technology and AI and all the things that people are talking about in the metaverse, we're going to be virtualizing more and more. Um, in fact, uh, Craig Rosenberg, who I mentioned earlier, just did uh, a segment for Gartner uh, this week or last week talking about the trends in modern account-based go-to-market demand gen um, and what we should be watching out for um, on the uh, kind of mixed reality, virtual reality, and how our buyers are very soon over the next one, two, three years going to be interacting with uh more digital um, uh, salespeople. Um, and so watch for those stories and get in front of that. Um, for companies that have not made the leap to sales engagement, whoo, huge opportunity. <laughs> well, if you could see my video, you can see this huge smile on my face. I'm picturing that, that bright future. Um, Fantastic. Well, you know, Lars, in this conversation, I have learned a tremendous amount. I mean, I, I've learned about the way that you three things really stuck out, stood out for me. The first was the way that you support an SDR with training, with a peer and with a manager who really cares. And also you're really looking for somebody who wants to learn on their own, who's, who's thirsty for that win. Um, the second was the importance of getting out of a bad deal early just because of all the the costs uh, that the organization will face and and being able to prioritize those accounts that are ultimately going to be really successful. And then the third was this idea around the marketing sequence plus the SDR sequence leading to a successful AE sequence um, and finding repeatability across different solutions or different customer sets. That's absolutely uh, just ab incredible insights there. Yeah, and if for those of you that want, Hillary Carpio is the director of account-based marketing at Snowflake. She's producing some really, really good content and, and stories and posts on LinkedIn. Go check out the stuff she's posting if you want to understand what I believe truly not just inspirational, but you know, world-class account-based marketing looks like at scale. Like we have an unfair advantage. Um, we are using technology, process, and people to get in front of not only the right people at the right companies, but now at the right time, right? Our use of uh, signals, um, our use of um, uh, uh, sentiments that are happening in conversations out there in the world, they can be tapped into. And um, uh, now we're using, uh, you know, you may have heard of companies like Bombora, Sixth Sense, even G2 provides um, uh, some sentiment and some signal uh, automation that helps you understand who's checking you out. And if you're not using that, it's, it's a, it's a force multiplier for sure. It helps us at Snowflake understand where we should go next versus just right for, I don't ever want a seller or an SDR to sit back and wait for inbounds. If you're doing that, you're looking for false positives to, to run your life. And for you at the end of a day to be sticking a, an ice pick in, in your eye because you've just been, <laughs> um, you know, you've just been decimated. Uh, instead, be intentional. Target the companies that look like the ones you've had success with before. Target the personas or the people that have titles where you have had success before. And again, in a longer sales cycle, realize that the people that care about your story in the beginning of a sales cycle are very different from the ones that get into a sales cycle in the middle and in the end. And be intentional, especially as a marketer, to understand who are the people that care about the journey that your seller is taking their buyer, their prospect on, so that you can generate content and release it to the people 
at the right place at the right time. Um, the story, when you begin an outbound account-based marketing motion, right, it has to make sense to the people you're sending it to. Um, and you can confuse your buyers quite a bit, right? Imagine you have a, a, an account, a customer account that has all these divisions and you have services people calling in, you have SDRs calling in, you have AEs calling in, and they're not aware that each of them uh, is calling in. And then you have three other marketing systems blasting out content to the same people. You can really confuse and you can get people opting out um, of your motions uh, very easily if you don't orchestrate, get sales and marketing in the same room. Um, and we have this legendary pairing between uh, our CRO, Chris Dagnan, and our CMO, Denise Pearson. I mean, they're like brother and sister and they legitimately love each other and they do everything together. And so we're always in the same room when we decide on strategies and motions that we're going to do together. Um, and it's become this beautiful motion that, um, you know, we, we're sharing with the world. That's incredible. It's absolutely a breathtaking thing to see in, in, in the performance of the company. And we're so grateful for your time today, Laura. Thank you for sharing all your insights across, you know, five publicly traded companies. It's a real privilege to have you here on Office Hours. And thank you for all the questions and, and the audience's attention. Uh, until the next time, thank you so much.